Thanks be to God for God's word, and thank you, Deanna. So we're going to look at committed prayer, but before we do that, I'm going to try to throw a curveball here. David, is it possible to show that breakthrough prayer video? All right, as he's getting that up, uh, we're looking at committed prayer, and we've been looking at, for the six weeks of Lent, breakthrough prayer. And breakthrough prayer is just something that we've been praying each time. And so as we look at that, we've been looking at different people that are committed to breakthrough prayer. Now, Terry, boy, he's really examining this. You can see him. His face is right on that screen. Terry's committed to ice fishing. I don't know why. I know that some of you are committed to that. I don't understand that. I'll never get it, okay? Looking down a hole. But he's committed. He's committed. But right in the commitment of his ice fishing, even more than that, he's committed to breakthrough prayer. Let's see how that works for him. It's exciting. <laughs> now it's time to pray. Gracious God, we ask you for the ability to break through the things of this world that come between you and us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that was an exciting video, wasn't it? <laughs> the ice fishing, that was, I, the adrenaline that comes with that ice fishing is amazing. <laughs> but the prayer was good. The prayer was good. Thank you, Terry. I appreciate that. <laughs> but as we are committed to prayer, pray. And we're committed to, I get that. You're like, we're committed to pray. It's hard to be committed when the trouble hits. And Daniel was in a lifetime of trouble. Not like us. He was in a lifetime of trouble. And so we're going to look at that as we look at committed prayer. Please join me in prayer. Gracious Lord, right there it says it all. No matter where we are at in life, what season we're in, what activity we're doing, your grace is always there. As we examine our own level of committed prayer, Lord, I understand guilt can override the grace, but don't let it, Holy Spirit. Let us just look honestly at our current commitment of prayer. And without guilt, but with challenge and joyful pull to, to go strong, Holy Spirit. Let us look at a way to deepen that commitment. Let your words in Daniel and the story of his life, let them come alive, Holy Spirit. I ask humbly, but with gratitude and expectation, Holy Spirit, may the words out of my mouth not be mine, but yours. And may we put the distractions on the shelf for a while and just hear you in ways to become more committed, not out of guilt, but out of grace. In Jesus' name, Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we're looking at committed prayer and that word in and of itself, commitment, that's a whole concept right there. If we want to be committed, then we have to want to do it. That, that takes a discipline. It takes a discipline to be committed to doing things. Uh, there are two individuals today, Mary Heitzman and Jake, he's up there with, with David. Uh, they're going to join the church today. They're going to stand up here and, and they're going to publicly commit their faith in Christ. They're publicly going to let you know we're Christians. And because we're Christians, like a lot of you have done, we're going to join the church and we're going to be active in it. They already are. But Mary's obviously active because we get the gift of music. And Jake's helping with David and he's helping some other stuff as we uh, work towards a third worship service on Saturday nights this summer out on the lake. <clears throat> Commitment is something that we have to choose to do. Obviously, we're committed to our jobs because we like our paycheck. But I hope we're committed to our jobs for more reasons than that. There's nothing worse than being committed to work because we just want to get to Friday. That's an ugly place to be sometimes. But commitment is something that requires us to want to go deeper than we already are. And it requires a risk, too. 
Daniel was knee deep into that because as an adult. But I want to back up to the beginning of Daniel. You see, when Daniel was born, he was born as a nation that was held captive by a larger nation. So instead of being a true Israelite, he was always born in a life that was held by the governors of Babylon. In Babylon, kings, especially King Nebuchadnezzar, wanted to take his certain Israel boys. Daniel didn't have a choice. He was handpicked to be on the king's court. And he was raised with Babylon influence. Even though he loved God, he was forced another culture on him. And that was his whole life. Anybody that had a reason to say no to God in the midst of daily life struggles and battles, Daniel had that reason. But he didn't. He stuck with God and it kept helping him through his whole life. He ended up in a furnace because of his faith. And, it, and he was renamed uh, Shadrach. He was part of the three Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those were the Babylonian names. <laughs> And then eventually, because of their faith, they were thrown into a fiery furnace. But God protected them. And then eventually, Daniel became part of the king's court as an adult, as Deanna read to us. Because he was committed, and he, he was willing to take the risk that happens when we come committed. Commitment means stuff that's engraved in us. And what commitment is, we're going to look at some of those qualities. And the first quality that commitment we can learn from, but first, I'm sorry, first I want to hit the verse that points out that Daniel discovered himself as an adult. Soon, Daniel, this is his in adult life, soon Daniel distinguished himself above all other presidents and satraps. They were local governance, governors of regions. We would call them a state, satraps and presidents, all over this vast kingdom. And Daniel wasn't even at, he started out that, at that level, but soon he became a position over the presidents and satraps. And because an excellent spirit, there is a commitment right there. Just let that word sink in, in verse 3. Because Daniel, I'll, I'll use the word, had an excellent spirit, or an excellent spirit was in him. In other words, even though Daniel was a foreigner in a foreign land, you could say a slave in the government, his excellent spirit, that's a commitment to prayer, a commitment to God, a commitment to his values, a commitment to his belief and faith. His excellent spirit put him in positions that gave him influence. Because Daniel was an excellent spirit, was in him, the king planned to appoint him over the whole kingdom. So what does it take to have that excellent spirit of commitment? What kind of prayer life does that take? Well, the first thing we must realize that we can learn from Daniel is Daniel knew what it was, what it, the importance of to establish absolutes in his life early on. Because if we don't establish those absolutes early on in our life, we're going to end up facing the absolutes. And there's nothing scarier than finding ourselves in different situations that we don't know the difference between right or wrong when we're in that situation. And we end up like a scatterbox. We don't know what's right. We don't know what's wrong. And we don't know what to decide. So what do we do? We go back in the corner and hide because we are in over our head. Early on in life... Daniel have established his absolutes growing up in the Israel faith and committed to not losing his faith in God, even in the Babylonian government center, he established his absolutes. Those things kind of happen to us as we're growing up. The key thing is, are we willing to recognize them as adults? Let me see if I can illustrate it in kind of a fun way. When I was growing up, and I was leaving my house, and our, our parents, my mom and dad, were taking us out to eat, or we were going somewhere as a family. And usually, for whatever reason, my dad and I would be one of the last ones to get out of the house. And my dad would look at me just to see if I had the brains to do it or not. And we were leaving, and the light was on, you know, in the house. And he, he'd have this hope in his head that I might have the established absolute of turning the light off so we don't have to pay the electricity bill. But, you know, I was a teenager. I walked out of the house and said, hey, come here a minute. I said, what, Dad? He said, look at this light switch. Was a light switch that you flip on and off? 
go, yeah. He goes, watch this. He turned it off and the lights went off. He goes, isn't that amazing how that works? <laughs> Some of you teenagers can't wait for your parents to try that on you. You wait. Anyway, so that was going on always while I was being raised. Now I want to fast forward it to when my son John was in middle school and high school. And we would leave the house and there'd be a light on. And I'd say, hey, John, what, Dad? Come here a minute. What? Look at this light switch. What about it? Turn it off. Okay, there, turn it off. Isn't that cool how the light goes off? You save money on your electric bill when you do that. Okay, Dad. Absolutes were being established. Another establishment of absolutes that I think we all are doing because you're here today, and I want to reinforce with you, especially you parents of children, amen, you're here. You bring your kids to church, and I'm telling you, that absolute gets established. You don't believe me? I'm telling you it works. The reason you're here is some of you, not all of you, because it's not 100%, but a lot of you are here because your parents brought you. And you didn't know what else to do on Sundays until you established that faith, and then you realized why you do it, and now you do it because you want your children to do it. And when they get older, I speak from experience, they will be in the midst of trade school, college, or military service, or where you, and they will say, it's Sunday, what do I do? I go to church. I don't know why yet, I'm getting that figured out, but I go because that's the way I was raised, and it's an absolute in me. And it does work. It does work. Daniel established his absolutes young. And so when he got into position, he knew what those absolutes meant. The reason we know that is because the scripture points that out. Let's just look at that in verse 5. So uh, all of the satraps and governors knew that Daniel was exceeding because he was good at what he did. And sometimes there's no avoiding getting people jealous of you. It doesn't mean you're arrogant. It doesn't mean you're wrong. It's just when you're very good at what you do, other people sometimes get jealous. And they create different ways to cause problems. And Daniel was in a situation where he was really good at what he did. And so the other sack traps, the other governors, they got upset because they saw him exceeding. The men said, we shall not find any ground, though. They, they wanted to get him. And they looked at the way he worked. And they looked at his absolutes. We can't get anything wrong with him. He's too good. We shall not... We shall not find any ground for complaint against this, Daniel. Here it is. Unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. In other words, they got together and they said, look, this guy is good at what he does. He's knowledgeable. He's confident. He's intelligent. And we can't get him that way. But we know how we can get him. This guy's got absolutes. And it's with his God. If we can trick him in that, he will go down. Because he won't falter with his God. We've seen it before. We've seen it when, when he was younger. Shadrach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego incident earlier in this book. We'll get him again with his God. This time it'll work. Because Daniel had absolutes. What else can we learn about committed prayer from Daniel? When we get those absolutes, we stick with them in the midst of the fiery furnace. When the cancer comes calling, when the divorce comes calling, when the thing at work, whatever that is, comes calling, when the rumors come calling, when the backstabbing comes calling, we don't cave. Do we get upset? Do we get angry? Yeah, we do. I do too. Do we yell at God? Yeah, we do. We do it in private. But we don't cave on our absolutes. And that's the importance of establishing absolutes. That's why I said it earlier. Because if we don't establish those absolutes, when we get in the situation, we look like a chicken with a head cut off. Running around going, I don't know what to do because I haven't th thought about this. I haven't thought it through. What do I do? What's right? What's wrong? But David was ready. That doesn't mean it wasn't easy when it happens. It doesn't mean that we get upset. It doesn't mean that in our prayer life we honestly say to God, I need you or I'm going to fold. Yes, we do that. But we know where our absolutes are and we stay by them. 
We don't throw them on everybody else. We don't convict anybody else. We don't enforce them on other people. We just know where we are. When I look at really good role models in life, you know what I love about the ones that are true and good role models in life for me? The ones that draw a line in the sand and they stick by it. I can't say enough about those individuals. The ones that are willing to say, you know what, I'm not in this for popularity. I didn't sign up for that. I signed up so I can establish this with God's help. And in the midst of a world that's constantly coming after me, I know where I stand. And there are certain hills I'm going to die on. And there are certain hills I'm not going to die on. The hills I'm going to die on, they're very few. But they are hills I'm going to die on. Those are the role models. Those are the ones that look up and go, that's what I want to be like. Not because they want to be better than everybody else or, or lifted up and seen in a way that makes them arrogant. I just know that their line in the sand means a line in the sand. So Daniel's committed to that. And that comes out in verses 6 and 8. All the presidents of the kingdom, the, the prefects, that's another word for local governors. The satraps, another word for local governors. The consulars and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an interdict that whoever, that whoever prays to anyone, except King Darius, divine or human, for 30 days, except you, O king, shall be thrown into a den of lions. Let me explain what that means. In those days, they had punishment, like we have capital punishment, whether we agree or disagree with that, but they had it. That's, whether we agree or disagree, that's another message. But they had it. They had also other things. And what they did is, I'm not making this up, I'm not trying to, to uh, get us all upset, but just so you understand, they'd throw them into lions that were dead and captive, and they would starve those lions for a day before they would throw... Uh, people into those dens so the lions would be hungry and they would also cut some of the people as they throw them in so the smell of blood and that would attract the lions and boom you can let your mind figure out the rest so this was serious stuff it wasn't just a story in the bible that we you know sing about and stuff like that it meant death and so they all got together and they went to the king and they said, King Darius, who they knew had not established absolutes yet, committed prayer. And they said to King Darius, we want to make this law so that you get worshipped for 30 days. King Darius doesn't understand his absolutes yet, even though he's a king. So he doesn't understand the consequences of his decision in his line in the sand. And then King Darius ends up saying, ooh, that's a great law. They'll worship me for 30 days. They'll pray to me as God. This is good. I'll be the God of the temple. He hasn't thought through all the consequences of what that means. His greatest asset, his best leader is going to die. So he signs the law, and then he realizes, you can read about this in Daniel chapter 6, he realizes, oh, great, what did I do? I just sentenced Daniel to death because I know him. I know his absolutes. I know his godly commitment. I know his commitment to prayer. He's not going to stop praying. I've been through this before with him. And all of the other governors and satraps, they look at Daniel, and sure enough, the next day after the law is signed, Daniel prayed to his God. Not arrogant, not rude, not to make a scene. He just did it genuinely. In those days, they didn't have cell phones with video cameras, so they didn't take a video of them. They just went to King Darius and said, and King Darius is new. He knew when they came. He knew what they were going to say. Hey, King Darius, you've got to see this. All right? You see the difference between one who has established absolutes and one who has it. Watch Daniel. Yeah, I see it. You know what you got to do. Yeah. And in the midst of that, Daniel knew what was going to happen. Now, I understand that if we read the book of Daniel, there's a much happier ending. I get that. He, he gets thrown in the den of lions, and then the next day, uh, King Darius looks, and Daniel's fine. Not a lion touched him. Oh, and by the way, 
The day after Daniel was thrown into the lions, King Darius de detracted that law, and he threw the three that came to him to make that law in the first place. He had them thrown in the den of lions with their families the next day, and they died. Committed prayer means that when I'm in the midst of a battle and it's ugly, and I'm not going to come out as a winner, and I already know that, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. I'm not in it for popularity. I'm not in it so that um, this can be done or that can be done. And those of you that have battled cancer and you've gone through the treatment of chemo and you know what it's like to be sick and you know what it's like to be weak and you know what it's like to, to catch germs on just a simple sneeze, you're not going to stop praying because you're committed to letting your God see you through this. Those of you that have gone through recovery, bless you. And you've gone through those days where all you want to do is fall from that recovery and you know how hard the battle is and you talk to God every minute and you say, get me through this second with your grace. Bless you because you've established the absolute of not caving. And those of us that are just going through everyday life and they want us to do this or that, but we know we're parents and we want to be absolute for our children. We want to be absolute for our grandchildren. And we know what we need to do. And we know that it's going to be a little ugly, but we're not going to be rude about it. That's not the point. Not to be rude, not to be arrogant. We're just going to establish our absolute because we're committed to prayer. And we're going to let the chips fall where they fall. Because that's the way it works. Sometimes the lions do eat us. And we're still committed. And sometimes the lions don't eat us. And we're still committed. The thing about Daniel that I like about him, and I really do, is Daniel always landed on his feet. He persevered, and he was a survivor. It was not a fun life for Daniel. His country was held captive his whole life and well after his death by the Babylonians. And even though he was on the Babylonian government and you think he had a lot of money, he was actually a slave. It doesn't matter. When he got out of the lion's den, he was a slave for Babylon. Maybe he sat in that lion's den and said, Wow, I know what I need to do, Lord, but if I die, <laughs> I don't have to be a slave anymore. He was committed because he had established where he wanted to be and God was more important than anything else in his life. And that line in the sand was drawn and that was a hill he was going to die on. And that was where his committed prayer was. We wonder why Grace Church exists. You know why we exist? So young people can find Christ. So adults can find Christ, whether it be in recovery or small group or in worship leadership or wherever. You know why we exist? So people can find purpose in life and grace and love that does not end. Even though the world says, hey, you know what? I don't like you. In fact, there's days when I hate you. This is a place where we can say, God loves you. And even though we act like we don't sometimes, and we do, we still want to say, God loves you, and that's absolute. Never going to change. There's nobody God doesn't love, period. Explanation point. And if we choose Christ, explanation point. We live forever, and we want that message to go, whether it be on Wednesday night, or Sunday morning, or Tuesday night, or whenever, or at a funeral. It's an absolute here. It's an absolute. Not only do we say that, not only do we become survivors, but we grow. We celebrate that today. But in our own lives, we understand that breakthrough prayer is just, you know, it's, it's a little more than just that card that we've been reading. I know you can't see it, but it's our breakthrough prayer card. It's a way to get committed to saying, gracious God, and understanding that word means a lot. And it's a way to say, God, it's through you. That's my absolute. That's the way I'm going to break through things. Darius, he doesn't understand that yet. 
He has not established committed prayer. And it's very clear that gets played out. I'm not trying to pick on him, just pointing out what another side of that looks like. What does he do? Therefore, King Darius signed the doc document. Daniel understood that. And he kept praying. Amen. And now, I'm going to spend a little bit in prayer. And then we have...